Great to have you along for the ride. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Glad to have this man on. His name is Mike Howell, Executive Director, Heritage Oversight Project. Go to heritage.org. Mike, how are you? It's good to see you today. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. Your, your tech's been going nuts. Your, your social's been going nuts. I mean, since last night, it is nonstop. All through the night, texts and phone calls, people are in freakout mode. That, that they are. It's been blowing up. My favorite category of text is, all right, you were right. I got a couple <laughs> of those. my left-leaning friends to the extent, you know. But it was a disaster, an absolute disaster. Yeah. I mean, we've been, uh, the core of a lot of our litigation efforts fundamentally relates to the hiding of information from, you know, by this administration. And nowhere have they been more sensitive in deploying more resources than hiding things that pertain to, to Biden. And uh, biggest examples are lawsuit for the her audio tape right. uh, with the spy fire criminal interview. And, and so when we see the arguments that they're advancing in court, like obviously we already knew Biden was in rough shape, but we had a better idea than most uh, by virtue of our aggressive kind of litigation uh, portfolio that something's really bad when Merrick Garland and others are basically debasing themselves and asserting a certain executive privilege and all sorts of other illegal conduct to hide things. And so what happened last night uh, you know, they couldn't avoid not having him at the debate. They've been hiding him other, otherwise pretty well. And what people expected to happen, unfortunately, did happen. Just a complete malfunction and an exposure. Well, I got to tell you, I do, I do this for a living. And, Mike, I did not expect uh, what happened last night to happen. And I'll tell you why. He came out in the State of the Union so hopped up on something that he was able to, and way too quickly for Joe Biden, but he's able to, to keep his train of thought pretty well. We know that MTG knocked him off kilter and got him mad about Lake and Riley. Then he called her Lincoln Riley. Uh, he didn't wait for the vice president to re-announce him, or I'm sorry, the Speaker of the House, to re-announce him, just blew past what Mike Johnson was supposed to do. But I thought we would see the hopped up, hyped up, ready to go Biden, as ready to go as he could be. We had a guy that was not only sick, his voice was gone. He barely blinked the whole time, was catatonic much of the time, lost his place. I think the uh, the phrase of the night from Trump must be, I don't know what he just said there. I don't think he knows what he just said. So uh, <laughs> I had an expectation that we would get the very best Biden available. And if what we got last night was that, we're in big trouble, aren't we? We're, we're in huge trouble. But there's a huge difference between last night and the State of the, un- the Union. The State of the Union is a controlled event. He's got a teleprompter. He probably has a working earpiece and, you know, can pause for applause. And right. he's just basically reading a script. Last night, even if he had an earpiece or someone communicating with him, you know, maybe it malfunctioned or something. Several times he was grabbing at his ear and kind of looking down in a way like there was something messed up in terms yes. of getting information to him or the unavailability of his notes. But, uh, you know, this is a contact sport. He obviously wasn't able to comprehend what President Trump was saying, what the moderators were asking and that's why he basically just malfunctioned and at times when you know he knew he was doing poorly he tried going back to just you know unrelated campaign stock lines and he ended up just jumbling them in incoherently i think right. the big, biggest example that was the funeral about uh one of the young girls killed by one of the illegal aliens joe left in he, he combined that into a talking point about uh sisters raping their sisters needing dude abortion. that was so weird weird I mean, it just didn't make any sense, and you're right. He was all over the place. I think he was embedded for six or seven or eight days with, you got to say these things. You have to get faux mad about Bo not being a sucker and a loser. You have to you have to talk about the economy or about abortion, about a 40% decrease at the border. But it was so jumbled together, none of it made any sense, to the point that even the leftists who were sitting on the CNN and MSNBC panels were all going, yeah, he's done. The View today said, yeah, he's done. What do we do about it? So let's talk about what does happen. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he has to himself remove himself because he's, or he already has all the delegates and he is the presumptive nominee. But it's not lost on me, Mike, that they had the debate before the conventions happen. What is the mechanism in place should the Democrats want to replace him? What do they do? Right. So the overall terms that people should be familiar with are substitution and withdrawal. Those are the legal terms that govern this. Substitution is what it sounds like someone else going in being substituted for for President Biden withdrawal is Biden voluntarily uh, stepping down. Uh, uh, let me back up and say about four months ago, Jason Chaffetz, former chairman of the Oversight Committee, who, you know, I work with very closely yeah. in, at the Heritage Oversight Project, and I sat down and said, we see where this is going. There's a very good chance he won't be the nominee. And so we engaged a 50 state survey and looked at every various state law process procedure and, and kind of laid out what were to would happen if they tried this. And the short answer is it is extraordinarily complicated and unprecedented. Some states have different rules than others about what qualifies as a legitimate reason to to do this. For example, death, 
uh, some states do not contemplate political convenience as a mechanism for this. Okay. And so the, another really important thing to, to note here is that what happens at the convention and the parties selecting their nominee is a completely different process than ballot access and who prints the ballots. And so okay. just because the DNC says somebody is their nominee does not guarantee ballot access for that person in 50 states. And the later we get, these states have timeline uh, uh, issues and other triggering events uh, that the DNC may not be able to overcome. And so the short of this very complicated thing is there could be, if litigated, and we will litigate should we feel that election integrity is not being followed, we will litigate to ensure that such a change cannot be improperly made. Okay. The end result then would likely be Hillary Clinton or Michelle Obama, you pick your, your crazy replacement, right. uh, having to run as a write-in candidate. And why does that matter so much is because the left invested in this ballot rigging scheme where they have unaccountable mail-in ballots. Imagine how much more difficult it is to write in a candidate's name in different handwriting uh, when they try to cheat it than it is just filling out the bubble on the Scantron. And so that's where this could be headed. It, well, it's also very complicated, but what you said just made a whole lot of sense. It's Mike Howell, Executive Director, Heritage Oversight Project. Is there some, a mechanism in the Constitution that, that is in regard to this? As I read the Constitution, and I've read it f- probably five or six times, I learn something new every time. There is a mechanism where you can challenge an election. Uh, the challenging of the election that would have happened on January 6th had the riot not happened was constitutional, was legal. It is not some some you know fancy transfer of power day, that's the day that you can actually challenge the results. That's allowed. Is there something, because the forefathers were very smart. Did they say, if a candidate can't make it to the election, here's what you do? Or is it really is something much more complicated than here's what you do? Because they made it pretty simple in many ways. It is very simple. It's, it's the same elegant uh, structure that underpins how our government's supposed to operate in that These election decisions and ballot decisions are left to the states themselves and particularly the state legislatures uh, to make the appropriate changes. I just want to interject this, though, and and you already know this. I'm sorry for interrupting, but you're right, except in 2020, they told the state, screw you, and the states did mail-in ballots where it wasn't legal, where the legislature did not not allow for it. And if you got rid of all the illegal mail-in ballots, and they were illegal by the laws of the states and by the Constitution, because they never approved them by law, um, if you got rid of them, Trump wins easily. So I hear you, and it should be up to the states, but you and I both know it kind of isn't, that the federal government does anything they want, the Democrats do whatever they want. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there is what the Constitution says, and there is what really happens in our post-constitutional exactly right. law for yes. weaponized United States of America. But that is the, the basics of the constitutional design. What, what I expect to happen is that states and even red states, we saw Ohio bend over backwards and Mike DeWine to, to bail out uh, the, the left there with, yes. with the Biden election issue. Uh, they're going to improperly allow for substitution or withdrawal, at which case we will run in there and, and sue or somebody with, you know, perhaps a a better claim will. But regardless, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, And and yes, you're you're 100 percent right. They've essentially criminalized in this country questioning the outcome of an election, uh, which is clearly first protected speech and civil rights to, 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 you know, do that as well. And they're basically crushing the civil rights of people who, for the, you know, a record amount of whom do not believe the last election was a free and fair one. And they believe that because it absolutely clearly was not a free and fair election. Just yeah. like this one, they're already building in tons of elements to rig it. All that being said, I don't think they're going to be able to rig it enough because the fundamentals of this are looking so bad right now. You're talking about needing a 10 to, to 12 percent you know, rigging in some areas, and that's just too much for the American people to tolerate. Well, it really is. Plus, you've got an RNC that cares now and is engaged now, and they're talking about 100,000 volunteers. I hope that's a real number. If that's true, we might actually have people observing, which would be different from 2020 as well. Mike Howell, Executive Director, Heritage Oversight Project. Let's talk about if Joe Biden, which I don't think he'll do, so I don't think Jill Biden will let him, but if he decides to come out tomorrow and say, you know what, I want to spend some time with the grandkids. I would like to, my, my health is failing in this, that, or the other way, and I am dropping out. Does that change how it works? Yeah, yeah, that would be what we would call a withdrawal. He would be withdrawing. And so the short of it is the sooner Biden does anything or the, any change happens, the easier it is legally to, to make sure there are no ballot issues. Every day that goes on, it, you know, goes by makes it more difficult. And so if you were President Biden, you were trying to stave off the pressure from President Obama and Hillary to get you off, you got to play this day by day and just get it to the point where Biden could argue it's if you if you kick me out of this, you're just going to lose the election because of all the ballot issues. And so that's essentially what's happening now. 
But uh, if you were to do this, and, and any circumstance really requires some degree of cooperation from President Biden, it would obviously be coupled with a criminal pardon, not for just for Hunter, but but for himself. Because uh, I, I think people are really underestimating the, the legal liability on President Biden, particularly in a lot of these things. Hunter, we're talking about tax and guns. We haven't even gotten to the, the corruption peddling and millions right. of dollars that went to jail. It is uh, Mike Howell, Executive Director, Heritage Oversight Project, Heritage.org. Let's talk about the audio tapes. I think last night gave a great opportunity for those of us on the right to say, we don't want the tapes anymore. We get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? We could almost say, no, we understand why you don't want us to hear the tapes or see the tapes or whatever. But when it comes to the actual uh, usage of executive privilege, tell me if I have this right. If you wanted to utilize executive privilege, Merrick Garland and Joe Biden, you don't hand over the transcripts. You say beforehand, hey, executive privilege, you don't, you, you don't get to even see what it is that he said. But when they didn't say that and handed over the transcripts, but now they're trying to claim executive privilege on the exact same case, the exact same words, according to them, you can't, you can't claim it then. Am I right about that? You're absolutely right. In fact, you articulated very succinctly the, one of the main arguments that we submitted last Friday night in our, our, our brief in this current ongoing case. Uh, executive privilege applies between the president and his close advisors. So does anyone in this world think that special counsel Herr is a close advisor of President Biden? Nope. Uh, absolutely, of course. He's not. And then you don't get to pick and choose the, 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 the application of it. Either it's all privileged or it's all not. How can a transcript be privileged and the tape or not be privileged, but the tape is. Yeah. And so those arguments, in addition to the department, Merrick Garland saying that they'll make deep fakes and then basically arguing that the, the regular law does not apply to this president. Uh, we beat you know the living daylights out of it in a briefing last Friday in, in court. And, 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 and finally, Attorney General Mukasey from the Bush years, as you remember, yes. who was basically what had the most expansive view of executive privilege of any attorney general. Uh, and Garland's argument was, hey, Mukasey did this. I'm kind of relying on what he did. And then we got Mukasey to go to the court and say, I'm the biggest executive privilege guy out there. Garland is so out of bounds right now. I don't even know what to make of it. And so <laughs> all of these things combining, we're going to win in court pretty soon and force the tape out. Uh, they're going to appeal and I expect we'll win on appeal too. Well, Mike, how is it not a, a, an easy comparison to Steve Bannon, clearly a close advisor to President Trump, Peter Navarro, clearly a close advisor. He was his trade guy in the administration with President Trump. How is that not executive privilege and available executive privilege, yet this somehow is? It doesn't make sense, does it? It, it doesn't. I mean, executive privilege is close advisors to the president and their communications to the president. And Steve Bannon asked to test that theory in court, and they denied him that, and they locked him up for it. And you know, there's a guy trying to work through the judicial system as designed, yeah. and he was denied that. And obviously, it's not lost on me. That Peter Navarro is probably on China's top ten most hated list. Of course, and you have the president compromised by the CCP. And make no doubt, the president is and his family agents thereof of the Communist Party in terms of the money, influence, and control over them. And they locked up, you know, one of China's chief nemesis and in, in Peter Navarro. That's what's really happening right now. I couldn't agree with you more. By the way, Hunter Biden says on audio, it's his voice, he's actually saying it, that he was somehow working with the top spy in China. We know that he won an Air Force Two when Joe Biden was the vice president and he left with the ability to manage over a billion dollars in Chinese funds. We, we know what the connections are, and Trump actually said it last night, the left is all calling that a lie. But, but back to this case, if you don't mind, when we're looking at executive privilege and looking at Merrick Garland running interference for Joe Biden, clearly running interference for Joe Biden, the people that work for Merrick Garland saying we're not going to prosecute our boss, duh, I mean, all of that is just dumb. Will the House of Representatives actually do what Anna Polina Luna said? We have in inherent contempt we will have the sergeant at arms put this guy in shackles and put him in the in the jail here in the house of representatives will they actually do that i think they should but will they no and if they do i'll come on your show and i'll eat my shirt this, <laughs> this uh, house majority is not really a majority in any sense of the term uh it's basically it will go as far as the the weakest links and there's just not the votes and leadership is pushing back on luna and doesn't support you know her call for the enforcement of inherent contempt. And uh, that's the story of this Congress. They were supposed to be the Oversight and Accountability Congress, and we got nothing, absolutely nothing, aside from what I thought Comer has done, which is get the, the receipts against Biden. Everything else has been a, a gigantic waste of time. And what we've been advocating is, even if they were to hold Garland in inherent contempt, which no one deserves more, 
there is so much more that needs to be done. And I'm talking hundreds of people wrapped up in subpoenas, depositions, and then the enforcement of those through inherent contempt. And there's less than, I think, 20 days in this Congress. They'll only be here for 20 days. It's it's functionally over. Yeah. And they've already funded the government through this, you know, 930. So take all the power, hire a legislative special counsel that's vested with your authorities to go out and disrupt the lawfare and election interference. And here's the kicker. They have access to almost $20 million from the January 6th committee funding levels that Jim Jordan was supposed to use for the weaponization committee that they have not used. So the money's there, the power's there, the option's there, but this house is going to continue to just the cycle of hearing and, and letter and, you know, please clap. And, and the DOJ and the executive branch is all powerful and there is no oversight, which really sucks. Hopefully that'll change and we get bigger numbers and more conservative numbers after November, after next January. It's Mike Howell, executive director, the Heritage Oversight Project. Go to heritage.org. Mike, incredible information. Do me a favor. Promise you'll come back again. Yes, sir. I would love to. All right. We appreciate you. We're back after this. Stay right here.